Hi everyone, welcome to our online course. We'll give a big picture of mobility today. It contains three parts. Introductions to current technologies, to future technologies, and to the bicycle sharing revolution in China. When talking about current technologies of modern mobility since 20th century, high-speed railway transport comes to my mind firstly. High-speed rail trains really facilitate our lives today. It used to take almost eight hours from my hometown to Guangzhou city by an ordinary train. However, it now only takes me two and a half hours by a high-speed train. There is no worldwide consensus on the definition of a high-speed rail transport yet. In general, New lines with design train speed higher than 250 km per hour and existing line in excess of 200 km per hour can be considered as high-speed rail. The world's first high-speed train had been put into service in Japan in 1964. It was also known as the bullet train. The first high-speed rail, uh, railway put into service in China is the rail connecting Qinhuangdao and Shenyang. It has a total length of 404 kilometers and had been put into service in 2003. By the end of 2019, the total length of high-speed railway in China has reached 35,000 kilometers. Although the surface of our high-speed rail transport started nearly 40 years behind, its operating scale ranks the first in the world now. So here shows the high-speed railway network in China. In 2020, the construction of four vertical plus for horizontal high-speed rail, uh, railway corridors have already been achieved. In the next 10 years, the plan is towards an eight vertical plus eight horizontal nationwide network. I suppose we are familiar with the looking of high-speed trains. A high-speed train set can be operated at speeds over 200 kilometers per hour, it comprises multi-powered cars, and the leading car is designed with a streamlined nose. There are almost 20 kinds of high-speed trains currently put into service in China. Only four of them are shown here. The first two kinds were put into, uh, put into service in 2007. These two uh, white trains here, um, their technologies were imported from other countries such as Germany and Japan. Uh, their design maximum uh, speed is 250 kilometers per hour. And the last two kinds were put into service in 2019. These two on the right side, uh, they have they both have complete independent intellectual property rights and their design maximum speed is 300 kilometers per hour. Following, I'd like to quickly introduce four characteristics of high-speed trains to you. First is its power distribution. An ordinary train normally uses one locomotive to drag the rest of the cars. However, a high-speed a high-speed train set has um, put its traction motors in almost every car. Therefore, power can be distributed to more axles, and faster acceleration and deceleration can be achieved. Also, by mounting the traction motors uh, below the floors and eliminating the locomotive, more space can be saved for passengers. 
And the next characteristic worthy to be mentioned is the pantographs of high-speed trains. Most high-speed trains get electricity from overhead wires using pantographs. Once a pantograph stands up and keeps in touch with the overhead catenary, it can take it can take electric power and feed this power to the high-speed train. Pantographs are normally designed in pair and mounted face to face. Thus, if there exist ice on the overhead catenaries in the winter, the leading one, the leading pantograph, can knock off the ice and clean the way for the latter. Okay, after introducing how the power is taken and distributed in a high-speed train set, it's time to talk about the braking system. Regenerative brakes, frictional brakes, and eddy current brakes are the three commonly used types. Regenerative brake is the most environmentally friendly kind. This kind of brake can generate uh, electricity as it works. The regenerated electricity can then feed another high-speed train on another track. It's a pity there is no room to store this regenerated electricity, which also cannot feed back to the national grid. If the regenerated electricity cannot be expanded, the high-speed train will result to frictional brake. As for the eddy current brake, it relies on changing magnetic fields and the eddy current uh, and the eddy cur currents they created. The electromagnetic interactions will give enough resistance to slow down the high-speed train. Now let's look at the railway tracks of high-speed trains. Most most high-speed train adopt ballastless track. As you can see uh, on the left photo here, is ballast track. Here these four important facts, including continuously welded rails, greater curve radius, banking angle, and grace limitation. These requirements are related to the comfortable and safe operation of high-speed trains. More design provisions won't go into detail in today's lesson because of the time limit. Okay, that's the end of the basic introductions to high-speed rail transport. We're going to turn to road transport now. These days, the most shining star in road transport belongs to the electric cars. China is both the largest manufacturer and buyer of electric cars in the world. Although affected by coronavirus this year, it is thought electrical vehicle market in China is still booming, thanks to creative tactics from both the government and the automakers. Shenzhen in China is the world's first major city to run an entire electric bus fleet as you can see in the right photo here. More than 16,000 um, electric buses and 21,000 uh, electric taxis have been put into service until uh, 2019 in Shenzhen. The benefit of switching public urban road traffic from diesel and gasoline to electricity is huge. A carbon dioxide emission cut of more than 1.35 million tons a year is achieved in Shenzhen. It equals taking 280,000 passenger cars off the road. The air quality in Shenzhen has been therefore improved a lot, as well as citizens' life quality. 
Now, let's dig into the key factor restricting the further popularization of electric cars, that is the charging infrastructure. Enough wall outlets or charging stations are very important to long range operations of electric cars, just as essential as gas stations for gasoline or diesel vehicles. Also, the government has already put, uh, has already built thousands of charging stations in Shenzhen. Electric taxi drivers still complain frequently about the deficiency. Here shows a charging parking lot, parking lot tower at the Biyadi headquarters in Shenzhen. Biyadi is a nationwide well-known domestic national mobile brand in China. There is still a lot of work and research to do in terms of the construction of, infra of infrastructure and of a world-class electrical vehicle technology. Um, from the perspective of energy supply, electrical vehicles actually can be divided into two kinds. The first one is called battery electric vehicles, or you can call them all electric vehicles. A battery electric car has one or more electric motors and it needs a large traction battery pack to power it. Just like our cell phones, a battery electric car runs on electricity exclusively. A charging station or wall outlet is indispensable to them. On the other hand, the battery electric cars emit zero exhaust and do not contain the typical liquid fuel uh, components such as a fuel pump, a fuel line, or a fuel tank. Another kind of electric cars is the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. It uses both an electric motor and an internal combustion engine. Compared to the first kind, a plug-in hybrid electric car is less dependent on charging stations or wall outlets because its battery can also be charged by the internal combustion engine or even through regenerative braking. Of course, this kind of electric car is therefore less clean compared to the all electric car. So next, let's get into the most exciting and promised part of our lecture today. That is the introductions to future technologies. We'll start with autonomous vehicles. An autonomous car is a vehicle capable of sensing its environment and operating without human involvement. The Society Auto, uh, of, Auto, um, of Automotive Engineers defines six levels of driving automation uh, ranging from level zero to level five. Level zero represents fully manual control, while level five represents fully autonomous. Radar sensors, video cameras, LiDAR sensors, ultrasonic sensors, and sophisticated signal processing software are five essential ingredients to, to an autonomous vehicle. Radar sensors monitor, uh, monitor the position of nearby vehicles. Video cameras can detect traffic lights, read road signs, track other vehicles, and look for pedestrians. LiDAR sensors bounce pulse of light off the car's surroundings to measure the distance, uh, detect road edges, and identify lane markings. Ultrasonic sensors in the wheels of the car detect curbs and other vehicles when it is parking. Sophisticated software then will 
uh, process all of these sensory input and plot a path and then send instru uh, in, uh, instructions to the car's actuators, which will control acceleration, braking, and steering. Um, I'd like to introduce a case study here. It will give you more intuitive feelings about, about autonomous cars. That is Pony Eye. Pony Eye is an autonomous vehicle technology company founded in December 2016, four years ago. Um, sorry. Its headquarters was established in Guangzhou in October 2017. This company have worked together with Toyota on testing self-driving cars on public, uh, public roads in Beijing and Shanghai. Last year at Auto Shanghai 2019, Pony Eye unveiled uh, its breakthrough on automatic driving technology to the public for the first time. I'll show you a video regarding Pony Eye's self driving road test in Guangzhou. Okay, let's stop. Here you can see when the car in encountering a motorcycle or pedestrian on the road, the self-driving car will slow down automatically and keep a certain distance to them. The person you see sitting here actually didn't uh, control the car at all. So let's continue. You see the car slows down keeps a certain distance to the pedestrian and keep the same lane, continue driving. It obeys the traffic rules. You see it stops at the traffic lines because uh, it, uh, the light turns red, means you need to stop. Okay. So, Pony Eye is now offering robot taxi experience in geofence district in both China and the US. It's pioneering self driving uh, ride, -hailing, uh, ride hailing project in Guangzhou. It's called uh, Pony Pilot. I'll show you another video demo about this project. So, Let's start. First, you can summon a nearby self-driving car via an app on your cell phone. This app also tracks the car's route for you. After you scanning the QR code, the auto journey starts. Okay, let's see here. On this screen, the user-friendly interface Pony High provides you with a look of surroundings from a way of how the automatic car sits. You see on the screen just in front of you. This may also make you feel much more confident about this auto journey. So let's continue.
Okay, that's it. So until now, the autonomous cars seem to be very cool and satisfy our imagination about future road transport. However, a question immediately comes up. That is, why do we need autonomous cars? In a recent study, experts found there are three trends needed to be, uh, needed to be adopted concurrently so that the full benefits of autonomous cars can be unleashed. These three, uh, these three trends are vehicle automation, vehicle electrification, and ride sharing. Through these three revolutions uh, in urban road transport, at least following five benefits can be achieved, uh, including reduced traffic congestion, cut transportation cost, um, and reduce urban carbon dioxide emissions, etc. Anyway, the final aim uh, is to protect our environment protect our planet, and therefore improve the life quality of our citizens. Um, another part towards future transport technology is the passenger drone. A passenger drone is a type of personal air vehicle. It is frequently seen in, sign, in science fiction movies. However, it's not just an imagination anymore. A Chinese company called Yihang unveiled the world's first passenger drone at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas in 2016. According to Yihang, their passenger drone is fully automated. There's no requirement for a pilot, uh, for a pilot's license to travel by it. Also, a passenger drone looks attractive and awesome. It, it is still a very new area. A lot of researches and innovations are needed to push this technology uh, go further. For example, a company researched on noise reduction, air, uh, airspace regulation, etc. are necessary. So, part one and part two of this lecture introduce you real road and future aerial transportation. At last, I'll give you a case study on bicycle sharing revolution in China. In China, bicycle sharing system is another short distance travel revolution closely related with people's daily life since 2016. Nationwide well-known bicycle sharing companies include Ofo and Mobag, which were founded in 2014 and 2015 respectively. But Mobike was acquired by a Chinese web company in April 2018. Here are some photos of these um, shared bikes from different companies. The red one is from the Mobike, the yellow from Ofo, and the blue one from the Blue Gogo. Shared bicycles are popular in China. Billions of rides have been taken on many millions of shared bikes. It's easy to rent a shared bike. All you need is a cell phone app. Bikes are typically fitted with GPS locators to enable users to find them uh, via the app. Shared bicycles solved what planners called the first mile, last mile problem providing commuters to and from public transit stations a greener and a healthier way. For example, you get out of a subway station, find a, a free shared bicycle nearby, scan a QR code, ride to your destination, and then leave and lock the bike there. That is convenient and simple. 
the period of a full bloom of shared bike uh, is the mid year of 2016 to the mid of 2017. Riding a shared bicycle on the road becomes quite general in, especially in mega cities in China. But the market saturation soon showed, uh, showed up in mega cities in the end of 2017. In November of 2017, Blue Gogo, once the third largest shared bicycle company in China, went bust. This picture shows a graveyard of these bikes at a parking lot in Shenzhen. This is really shocking. Another problem is the uh, irresponsible use and uncontrolled management. Many people have complained about disorderly placed shared bicycles. As you can see in the right photo, um, they just block the sidewalk. Also, there exists some people try to make these public shared bikes private. In addition, shared bikes do break frequently. Thus, across China, provinces have to nominate uh, refuse dumps for, the, for them. In terms of these mentioned problems, deep revolution of bicycle sharing uh, system is imperative. Several aspects can be considered carefully, such as how to improve the uh, how to improve the responsibility of users, and you need innovation in vandalism supervision, controlling over capacity, more rational allocation, and reuse the waste bags. These are the uh, these are also the challenges if you uh, if if China want to go deeper revolution of the bicycle sharing system. So that's also uh, researchers like us need to do. So that is, that's the end of our uh, lecture today. I hope this is useful and helpful to you. That's all, thank you.